reaction to stability. All those tools have natural analogs in, in walking. Okay, so um, I think this is an important point. You know, if I'm just picking something up, right, then of course I could talk about the stability of the chalk in my hand, but I don't think the, the carryover is as great uh, in these more finite tasks. Should I stall or should I go? Go? Oh, good? Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, lots of reasons why I, I like to start, I, I like to describe contact through the lens of walking robots. Um, let's start with passive walkers, passive dynamic walkers. That's where some of the simplest models come from. I don't even have, need an actuator to start talking about these things. I showed some videos early, I think I did. My internet was not working on the first lecture, but I think I was able to show some of these very simple um, machines. This is, <laughs> this is more simple than I, we're gonna get to, but uh, uh, this is a video of Tad McGear. So back when, um, so Mark Raybert was making, and the Leg Laboratory was making robots hop around and jump through the air in the early 80s. Around the end of the 80s and around you know, 1990, Tad McGear came up and came up, showed the world these passive dynamic walkers. And this is in Tad's own words, uh, how he, ex he thought about them. Let's see if I can. This familiar toy is a passive dynamic walker. With energy supplied by a falling weight and the right start, it settles into a steady walking cycle sustained by an entirely passive interaction of gravity and inertia. This machine is also a passive dynamic walker. For that matter, I may be a passive dynamic walker. As you'll see, our gates are quite similar. The camera was running the day when the analysis and my intuition were brought conclusively into line. I just love his delivery. I just, uh, okay, but that was, that was really important work. And along with the hardware of these robots that started to walk down a small ramp, okay, he also gave us some very simple models that um, I think they really capture the essence of what's happening in walking and the, the fundamental dynamics of walking in a good way, okay? Now, you can make more complicated robots. So Andy Ruina, Steve Collins was the, is in the yellow shirt there. The, like what I still consider is the most impressive passive dynamic walker to date. That, that is just, an, I mean, maybe even the most impressive walker to date. You, I, I would challenge you to find another powered walking robot that looks as beautiful and as natural, like a stroll through the park, as that robot, right? Um, just kind of, just this beautiful, there's no actuators, no controller, it's powered only by gravity. Right, and it's just beautiful. He's got a little bit of a, you know, hook to it, but, uh, but my gosh, just a, a, a masterpiece. Um, it led to very simple models. This is Art Quo's um, rendition of that McGear Walker with a <laughs> comedic ending. Um, and the simplest models, as you, you know, as you boil those mathematical models down to their essence, the simplest models that we'll spend time on, on today is making sure we understand the limit where your walking robot has, is just a wheel with its rim removed. This is called the rimless wheel, okay? And you think about um, instead of, so of course we'd like to think of it as a biped, but instead of even, we're not even gonna worry about the dynamics of the leg getting around to, the, to be in the right place for the next footstep. We'll just fix the legs and make sure there's extra legs ready to, to connect. And this is actually the simplest model of walking that we can completely understand. And it's the only model we'll completely understand, um, but we can, we'll do increasingly complex. We can build up from here, uh, again, back to the full thing, right? What's beautiful about this is that, um, if you watch, it's, it actually slows down, but it enters, um, this is again, completely passive. It actually enters a stable limit cycle behavior. I'll define limit cycle carefully, okay? Um, but that will roll forever because um, at its steady state, periodic steady state, the energy it loses when its foot collides with the ground is exactly balanced by the energy it gets going down the ramp, okay? And these things find a, a perfect balance and they cause a stable balance so that if, you're, if it's going too fast, as we see, it slows down. 
If it's going too slow, it speeds up. And this will, from many different initial conditions, roll at exactly that stable fixed point. Okay? So I want to make sure you understand that um, by the end of the lecture in some detail. Cool. Okay. So uh, there's two big sort of pieces to help you understand that. And they're going to serve you well for more complicated robots too. The first one is just what does it mean to have stability when we're talking about periodic motions, cycles, okay? Uh, so we have to extend our basic concepts of Lyapunov and the like into the limit cycle case. And the other one is this, we're now making and breaking contact with the world. Um, and there's various ways to model that. We'll talk about the hybrid systems version of that, of contact modeling today. So let's begin. All right, let's talk about limit cycle stability. You don't actually need contact. These are separable, right? So you can have contact without periodic stability, and you can have periodic stability without contact. Those are two separate ideas. Uh, in fact, you've already seen a good example of, um, of a stable limit cycle. Remember the Vanderpoel oscillator? You didn't study its forward dynamics in, in your problem set, uh, but this is the vector field if you were to simulate those equations, those polynomial equations, which you used in your P set. Um, if you simulate it forward in time, these are some examples of the trajectories you get. And in fact, from any initial condition except for the origin, this will converge to that black cycle. Even from outside, it slows down. From, up, from inside, it speeds up, and it goes to that black cycle. Just, you, know, you, you, you looked at it, the time-reversed version of that before so that you could try to prove the stability of this fixed point when you simulated everything backwards in time. But forward in time, it's this natural oscillator. And it's one of a family of oscillators. You've heard, heard of many different um, you know, some canonical oscillators that are out there. Vanderpoel is just one of them. So um, let's think about how you would say, I mean, it's very natural, I think, to say that this periodic solution, the black line, is a stable solution, right? If you knock yourself off that solution, it goes back. But uh, we have to make sure we're careful about the way we talk about stability in that case, right? So the Vanderpoel, So let's think what, what exactly we mean by stable in the sense of a limit cycle. Okay, so let's recall for a fixed point, um, we had, for instance, asymptotic stability said my fixed point was called x star, then my asymptotic stability said that if x0 was x star plus some epsilon, then I'd like to say that the limit as t goes to infinity is that the distance between x t and x star goes to, is 0. Right? So I'd like x to converge to x star as the time goes to infinity. So we have to somehow extend this to the case of a periodic solution. So um, you know, now we certainly have not a point x star, but we have some sort of a, a trajectory, xt. Okay? And moreover, we have, you know, for all t, there's some period for which x star periodic. So we need to somehow extend this a little bit. Now maybe a, a, a perfectly reasonable starting point would be to say 
well, I'll just make this a function of time, and then everything else should be the same, right? Maybe I just say that um, the limit as t goes to infinity x of t minus x star of t is 0. And that, that's a perfectly reasonable definition to throw around, but it's not going to help us with this system. Can you see why? Yeah? If it's like offset in time in the period that it won't converge even though... Exactly right. So, so I'll just say that aloud so everybody hears, right? So if I have two points that are different locations in time, but they're both on the cycle, then even though it's converging to the cycle, those two points will continue to go around at a different phase and will never converge to zero. The distance between two points, you know, to, or to say it, I could make an epsilon perturbation along the cycle and it will not converge back to the original cycle. There is no stability in the direction of the cycle, only off the cycle, okay? So we need a different notion of stability, but you don't have to change much. Anybody have a proposal? I mean, the intuition, I think, is, is kind of clear, right? You're, you want to somehow measure the distance to the manifold of solutions instead of to a point that's moving through time. You don't want to describe that as a as a trajectory in time, you want to just say, the, I want to say like the distance to that whole curve, right? So the way we write that, that's, that's going to be called orbital stability. And what we'd like to say is that um, the minimum over tau of x of t minus tau, I'd like this thing to go to zero. Make sure that parses for me, right? So I'm allowed to, to so the black curve is parameterized by tau, and for any point, the distance is going to be the closest point in tau. I'm allowed to find, move along this trajectory and find the closest point, the minimum distance, and I'll take that as my measure. So anywhere on the cycle, the distance is zero. Anywhere off the cycle, it's the shortest path, it, it's the closest distance to the cycle. So this is the, the phase I'm allowed to search over, if you will, and I'd just like my trajectory to go to the orbit, okay? Now you can go asymptotically there, you can go exponentially there. There's, um, you know, you could, there's asymptotic versions of this, exponential, Etc. All, all the various versions, you can have finite time convergence, all, the, all those ideas hold in the orbital stability sense. So um, a limit cycle you know, the, the definition of a limit cycle is a um, is a stable, an orbitally stable or unstable actually, you can have unstable limit cycles, um, periodic solution. Interestingly, marginally stable, it's kind of, it's just a maybe the language that we've picked, but um, you know, the, the notion of a limit cycle is the limit set of some dynamical system. If you have a one that's forward in time that's stable, it's the limit set of the dynamics in the forward in time. If it's unstable, then it's actually the limit set going backwards in time. So in both cases, it can be thought of as the limit set. When it's marginally stable, for instance, like the um, constant energy curves in the pendulum, those were all periodic 
solutions, but they weren't stable in any sense, unstable or stable. And they're also not the limit of any dynamical system. Uh, it just, we tend to not call or marginally stable uh, cycles, limit cycles. Seems to imply something about a blowing up or, or, or not. Is that clear? So this looks like a potentially hard thing to work with, right? So suddenly uh, the machinery of just measuring even like the distance is um, somehow much more complicated. And especially if these curves are often like the solution to the Van der Poel oscillator, I only have that numerically. I don't actually have a closed form solution, even though this is about as simple of a dynamical system as I can hope for. I don't even have an analytical expression for that solution, right? I only have a numerical one that I got from integration. So how do we even, how do we compute that? I'd like to do things like take eigenvalues. I'd like to have the Apinov functions that I construct around this. Um, and that, that seems like a bear, this min over t is a little bit ugly and even just having bad representations of that seems like a barrier. Okay, so, but we're gonna be able to do all of that. Um, you know, we're gonna be able to linearize and take eigenvalues to talk about the rate of convergence, right? We're gonna be able to do Lyapunov functions. So how do you make those work? What's the, what's the big idea that makes that potentially ugly looking thing and the the notion of a manifold, you know, what does it make all, so there's something that has to make all that better. And the thing that makes all of that better is Poincaré analysis. I'm gonna use something called a Poincaré map. And the reason to love Poincaré maps is because it turns the, um, converts stability of a cycle into the analysis of stability of a fixed point. seems almost too good to be true, right? How can it possibly do that? Let me give you the mechanics of it, and then we'll appreciate why it works, okay? So for the Van der Poel oscillator, I have Q, Q dot. I've got my slightly boxy solution. Yeah, that's not great, but hopefully it's good enough. Got my multicolored chalk. Okay, so the mechanics first of doing a Poincaré analysis or a Poincaré map analysis is I'm gonna de define um, a surface of section is what it's called. I'm gonna pick some, that's a, that's a line that has zero thickness. Sorry that I didn't draw that very well. I'm gonna call this the surface of section. surface of section, if I have, um, if my state lives in um, Rn, if I have n state variables, then the surface of section is um, n minus one dimensional. So I, I need to somehow have, this is going from two to one, I've got a one dimensional surface here. And in this case, I'm good. I've just called it uh, Q equals zero and Q dot greater than or equal to zero. So I've just defined that as my surface of section. And what I'm gonna do is instead of analyzing the original continuous time dynamics and all the complexity of this orbit, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make, define a new dynamical system, which I'm, every time I look at, I'm gonna look at a point on the surface of section and I'll go ahead and integrate out what happens, but my dynamics are just the evolution of the 
time, every time it crosses the surface of section. Okay, so I'm going to write a new dynamical system. I'll call this XP at time n for the Poincaré map, for my state on the Poincaré map on the surface of section. And I have a new now discrete time system. That is the dynamics on my Poincaré map. Time is even a funny thing to call it. But I'm going to have an iterated map. The fact that it, there's no uh, strict connection to time. It might take a different amount of time to go from here to here than it does from here to here or here to here. That time is abstracted away, but I have an iterated map that goes from any one crossing to the next crossing. Yes? What happens if you move along the surface? Good. So there's a, the condition when you're picking the, that was a great question. He says, what happens if you move along the condition? The, the requirements when you pick this surface of section is there's a transversality condition, which says you can't move along the surface. Basically, it says everywhere your vector field should be transverse in some way. It's, it's not allowed to be um, parallel with the surface of section. Yeah. So that's disallowed by definition. Great question. Okay, and the other thing you need to have is you want to have a bounded upper bound on the time it takes to return. Okay, so you, you don't want to have uh, solutions where it would like go away and never return to your map. Okay, you want to define a map that every time you visit in some upper bounded time, I'm going to get back. If you have that, here's the amazing thing. This is a, just a, we know how to analyze discrete time systems. We've talked about those before too. You could take eigenvalues, you can do all these things on a discrete time system. If you do that, then actually implying, if you have a, a, a point that's stable on the Poincaré map, that implies that the limit cycle that corresponds to it is stable. If it's asymptotically stable on the map, it's asymptotically stable. If it's exponentially stable on the map, it's exponentially stable. Right, good, I like that facial expression. How could that possibly be, right? It comes through, it, basically, if you have a deterministic system with a vector field, there's only so many things it can do, okay? And in fact, you can infer, uh, you know, that, that solutions, there's, there's some requirements, right? That there's, some, there's some requirements, but uh, we're gonna see discontinuous vector fields that still this holds, okay? And, uh, and in fact, you can make statements just looking at the map that describe what must happen in between. Yes. Yeah. What if you start at a point where, like, for whatever reason, maybe you never make it to the surface? Right. That's also so over here, or something, or, or even on. I don't on. know what the rest of the vector field looks like, but maybe like somewhere like down to the left. Yep. Where for whatever reason, maybe it never goes up and goes down, and for whatever reason, yep. it will happen there. Is it still asymptotic? No, 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 no. So, so that's what I say. You have to have an upper bound on the time to return. Oh. So, but that 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 means you must return. If you, if you can find a surface of section, which is transverse everywhere, and has an upper bound on the, the return time, then you can infer something about this. Stability of a fixed point here implies stability of the limit cycle here, without dealing about all the complexity of time. Okay? In fact, for instance, I mean, even the rate of stability, or the rate of convergence, if you look at the eigenvalues of that of the linearization of P, the eigenvalues of this will tell you about the stability rate, the rate of stability, the convergence rate. Right? This is a discrete time system, so you'd like the eigenvalues to be um, the absolute value to be less than or equal to one, maybe even less than one. Yes. Does a fixed point on the map necessarily have an associated limit cycle? Yes. So a fixed point on the map will have a, a, a periodic solution. So we could talk about whether it's, the, you know, I, I did say the weird thing about the marginally stable, but, but so you could have a marginally stable fixed points here too. Okay, now you said if I'm down here and I were to blow off up down here, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so say if you come back to the same point on S, 
Okay. Yeah, so you can't do, that's a, that's, a, that's a great version of this. So he says, what if I'm like going like this, but every time I go around, I go farther and farther down. This, this vector field, you know, differential equations can't do that, right? So if, I, if the state completely defines my dynamics, then if I'm in exactly the same state, then I'm gonna take exactly the same path. And that is the essence of why Poincare, Bendix, and all these things uh, work is that there's a limit. I mean, this completely describes the flow of the system. If you're in the same point, there are related theorems. Like if you're in an invariant set, if you know that you never leave this set, and you know that there are no fixed points in that set, then there must be a limit cycle somewhere in that set. There must be a periodic solution, because otherwise you couldn't stay in the set forever. That's the poincare bendix theorem. In a Silly little cartoon. Yeah. Um, what about the case with the, uh, uh, the pendulum going down the hill? The speed will keep changing, um, and then you'll never go back to the same place. Awesome. So, so um, he says, what about the rimless wheel example? We're going to see exactly how you apply it in the rimless wheel example, but we're going to um, we're going to analyze it in a coordinate system that stays fixed. So we're going to shift the coordinate system back because the cycle. It, you're right that the cycle. Um, you know, it's not fixed in that sense. It's, it's rolling, but there's a coordinate system where you can do exactly this analysis. Great question. Okay, so um, it turns out that there's, I won't dwell on it, but you should, I just want you to know that the same kind of, remember the graphical analysis we did where you just, you look if things are below the line, up the, above the line, you know, all that stuff. There's, a, there's an analysis, there's an analogous version of that for discrete time systems. I'll do it very, I'll show you roughly what it looks like here for the, um, for that particular choice of surface of section for the um, Vanderpool oscillator. So if I think, if I plot xp of n, xp of n plus one, then at zero, at the origin, I just stay at the origin. So x, if xp of n is 0, xp of n plus 1 is also 0. When I'm, um, when I'm a little bit positive, see there's a critical line here, which is the line of slope 1. Because when I'm a little bit positive, I know that I'm expanding out, right? As, as I return, as I visit the Poincaré map, if I start a little bit positive, I'm going to move more positive up until some critical point, and then I'm going to, when I'm up here, I'm moving more negative. So the way that works here is I ended up with a plotting the Poincaré map, and it looks something like this. The same way you look for fixed points, right, and the continuous uh, graphical analysis, this is going to be a fixed point, this is going to be a fixed point. They're going to be the ones where xp of n is exactly xp of n plus 1. So it's the, whenever they intersect with the line of slope 1, that's a fixed point. And you can understand the stability, the local stability, by looking at the slope of those lines. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated. It's, it's not just that if you're above, then you're moving that way and below. Discrete time systems can jump around. So and actually, to, uh, to understand the stability of these things, you actually have to do these little iterated maps, which I'll just let you see one, but, uh, but we won't worry about the details too much here. So you basically say, okay, I'm at xpn plus one. I know my next xp is going to be this value. Now to repeat the cycle, I'm going to project myself to the line of slope one. That's just like reset me to the next one here and then repeat that operation. And you can, you'll see these iterated maps where people draw the convergence here okay, of how the, these systems discreetly converge. And you can see the, this explicit number of steps that it'll converge to that fixed point. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of, I mean, it's, it's still um, exponentially converges when you get close. Okay, so gra you know, the point there is that graphical analysis works here too.
Okay, that's a crash course on limit cycles. The other piece we need is contact. But if there's any other questions on limit cycles at that, at that level, fire, fire away. Do, limit, do we like limit cycles? Yes? Okay? All right. It's better than the midterm. Okay, second big piece is how do we start modeling contact? You know, I've got two rigid bodies that suddenly come into contact. You've, you've done this in physics. You know, you can imagine elastic collisions, inelastic collisions. You can imagine sustained contact where there's a contact force that has to be applied, you know, these apply forces on each other when they're touching together. If my foot's on the ground, my foot's applying force to the ground, and the ground's applying force to my foot. You know, those, are, those have all governing laws. And um, you don't, it doesn't take much uh, to make our robots think about them, but it does complicate the design and analysis. And you have choices. There's modeling assumptions that will make those better or worse for our numerics. Okay, so there are many, many, Approaches. Bless you. Um, <clears throat> one that's very common in simulators, for instance, would be to use um, a spring model, a, sp a spring damper model. For instance, if I have my That's a robot foot, okay? Uh, and this is the ground, right? If that foot comes in contact with the ground, so now it's down here, then a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do would be to say, I'm gonna take this point where it went into the ground, and I'm gonna have a spring pulling it back up into the, uh, you know, out of the ground. And you maybe need some dampers so you don't shoot out, you're not on a trampoline, uh, right? But a lot of simulators will use like a spring damper model that allows objects to penetrate a little bit but creates force once you start penetrating that try to push you back out of contact. But in order to get reasonable um, simulations here without having like uh, the robot, you know, dive deep into the ground and have, you know, obvious visual and sort of, um, you know, bad artifacts on your analysis, you tend to need to make that stiff very, that spring very stiff, okay? And that's a, a nasty, that's nasty business for, it's, it's kind of okay for simulation. We've got like good enough simulation methods to power through some stiff dynamics, although you, you'll see there's a lot of work in making a contact solver work in a modern simulator, okay? It's to fight those kind of stiffnesses. But for trajectory optimization, that's bad news. Right? Like our trajectory optimization that we've done before, for instance, you know, we say, okay, I'm going to sprinkle some points along in time. Maybe these, you know, I only want 41 points. You know, you see me choosing weird numbers like that in the code, right? I want to only want 41 points, so maybe my time step is like 0.1 seconds. Okay? If I come into contact with the ground and I have a stiffness that's, uh, that's commensurate with the mass of my robot, that suddenly it's off here and it turns on there, then a lot can happen in 0.1 seconds, right? These are, these are almost discontinuous events that happen in here. So if you start using these elastic models for trajectory optimization, you end up having to pick extremely small time steps to the point where, and you have to simulate very slowly, to the point where it becomes uh, computationally very demanding and, and frail, okay? Um, <coughs> A different approach is hybrid modeling, especially with impulsive collisions. So a different thing you can do is you can say, 
when the foot touches the ground, at the instant it touches the ground, I'm going to pretend that the foot is welded to the ground. I'm going to add a new constraint saying that I'm exactly touching the ground. And I'll rewrite the dynamics with uh, some equality constraint. We'll make this clear in the rimless wheel where it's, it's all simple and good. Okay. And then I'm going to admit that there's something dramatic that happens the instant I touch the ground. I have to model in a, a collision event, a discontinuous change in my velocity, which stops the foot. It's a delta in force over time. It's an impulse, okay, which stops the foot. But then if I admit that there, if I have to do some event detection in my simulator to know when the instant that happens, but then I can have beautiful, smooth, low, you know, uh, low stiffness equations here and then beautiful equations over here. And that turns out to be a very powerful abstraction for, for planning and control. Okay. So again, I think the rimless wheel is where this stuff really shines. It's the equations are simple. We can understand everything. And it has a lot of these details inside it. So the rimless wheel, I'm going to have it fall down this way. We always parameterize the ramp angle as gamma. The speed it will roll at, it's actually stable at many different ramp heights, but it'll have a different rolling speed at steady state. Um, I'll draw it like this. Okay, where I have a, well, first of all, what's the, what's the state space of this system? What would be a natural Q or X for this system? Yeah? Uh, angular velocity and rotation. Angular velocity and rotation, good. So, so, um, if I just did sort of theta and then q dot is theta dot. So that, that's actually the answer I want. I thought you might say also, because if I, if I want it to be up in the air and I want to be able to you know, change which feet are on the ground or whatever, then, um, then actually you might be tempted to also include x and z or y, whichever you want to call this, right? Um, x dot and y dot. And if you have a soft contact model, you actually do need all of those variables, right? Because the you won't know just from an angle sort of where you are in space. Okay, but as Cole says, we're going to just keep this super minimal and only think about the angle of that robot as completely specifying the state, which is consistent with us saying we're going to assume that uh, one foot is always on the ground, exactly on the ground. And we'll even ordain that it's in this court. We're going to write our coordinate system around the point of the foot. Okay. And then when the next foot hits the ground, we'll do some discontinuous change in the coordinate system in order to keep that model the same. Okay. So it's actually a one degree of freedom system which is going to be great for graphical analysis, by the way. We're going to assume that there's a pin joint at the toe. That's sort of a reasonable assumption as long as my mass is sufficiently over that I, I mean, in the full glory, it would have a friction cone. We would, at some point, allow it to slip. But as long as we're inside the friction cone, um, you know, we can, we can think of the dynamics here as having a pin joint at the toe. So that's kind of the infinite friction case, I guess. Would certainly give us that. It actually doesn't require infinite friction to be a reasonable assumption, but. 
no slip. This is the real thing, okay? And then we're gonna make some assumptions about the collision, okay? So we're gonna say that the collision is inelastic and impulsive. Okay, so when the foot comes down, it doesn't bounce. All, uh, all energy going into the ground will be dissipated into the ground. That's what it means to be inelastic, is that it's gonna be a um, plastic collision. It's gonna go down and stick. We've built rimless wheels. They don't stick, they bounce all over the place. It's really annoying, okay? So I don't, I'm, I don't claim this as saying how th this is the truth of physics. This is an approximation we're gonna make to make the equations cleaner, okay? I actually think the soft contact models are probably better fidelity in modeling the real physics. They're just nasty to work with. Um, so we're gonna, this is, means no bouncing. For instance, okay. And we're also going to assume that there's an instantaneous liftoff, so there's no double support. When you're a walking robot and you've got one foot on the ground, you're in single support. You've got two feet on the ground, you've got double support. I'm going to assume that never happens. The instant that this foot hits the ground, this one releases from the ground and starts rotating. The kinematics support that. Um, as we'll see, it's all consistent, but we're going to basically model it as if no two feet are never on the ground at the same time. Now it's interesting, you can actually simulate this thing standing still under this model, but the simulation is actually, uh, it's, it has an infinite number of, of collisions in a finite number of time. It will converge on a, it's like a Zeno paradox, uh, if people know that, but it will actually simulate by going and then just infinitely frequent collisions to stable to, to talk about the standing fixed point. But it's it fits in the mathematical model. Okay. The great thing about this, and one of the reasons that I've talked so much about the pendulum and the like, and I have so much, is that this is just a pendulum, right? So the dynamics of this are basically the dynamics of a pendulum, okay? It's a pendulum that can only rotate through a few angles. It's in the upward, it's around the upright configuration. I'm also gonna, I'm gonna call this half angle here is alpha. So the angle between there is two alpha. And so what that means is in the phase portrait of the pendulum, theta versus theta dot. This thing lives between, you know, the only places, it, the only angles that are supported are this, this distance here is gamma minus alpha, and this distance here, or sorry, this, uh, it's actually not the distance, it's the location. This location is gamma minus alpha, this one is gamma plus alpha. Okay, there's, there's a boundary of the relevant theta where that thing can be out of collision. And what happens when I simulate this is I start with some initial conditions. Let's say I start here. It's gonna follow the dynamics of the pendulum exactly like we'd expect, okay? When I get here, we're gonna de derive the impulsive collisions, okay? I have an instantaneous change in my coordinates. I'm gonna switch which foot is on the ground, which is equivalent from moving discontinuously from this to this. And in the process, I'm gonna lose some energy. So by losing energy, I know I'm gonna go down in velocity. So I'm gonna move this way, but down a little bit. So I'll reset to this, okay? And then I'll start simulating again. Okay, so that's the kind of cycle I expect to see. It's exactly the pendulum during the stance phase, and then it's this discontinuous jump, which we can derive easily for the inelastic collision. I actually want to do that, uh, not the algebra of the derivation, but I just want to make sure you <coughs> see what how you would do a derivation like that. How would you convert 
the assumption about an inelastic collision into an update, which says what happens to theta dot when my foot hits the ground. Yes, please. Awesome question. So the question was, if you're losing energy, then how could you possibly go back up to the uh, spot of, of higher energy? Anybody know? Good. He's, so it's because we're also going down the ramp. No, that's, that's a, great, it's a great question. It's hidden. In that reset map, you're doing two things. You're losing in velocity, but you're actually gaining potential energy. And it's exactly those balance. And that's happening because we're resetting the coordinate system of theta. So it's kind of hidden in the equations, but it, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. So the physics of thinking about the robot when um, you know, this foot is in a pin joint, this one is, we're rotating this way and about to come into contact with the ground here. Okay. And we'd like to derive an update for theta that says, even though I'm, I have, let's say, the point of the foot here has some velocity going into the ground, after the collision, it should have zero velocity going into the ground, okay? And all energy going into the ground is lost, but all other energy is conserved, okay? So the, the way that plays out is you basically say, at the moment of collision, the angular momentum is conserved about this point. So um, graphically, the way that works is you can compute the angular momentum just before contact. The, um, the only momentum in the system, we, we, the only mass in the system is actually a point mass at the, at the hip. I did the simple version of this robot. If we assume that the mass is, conser is only concentrated at the hip, then the only momentum in the system just before contact, it was rotating around this, okay? So the velocity of the center of mass was here. And I, my angular momentum is gonna be this length vector cross mass times velocity, okay? So I'm gonna call this my velocity minus. Velocity minus is just the instant before collision. And I'm going to say V plus is just after collision. Similarly, I'll have theta dot minus theta dot plus. Okay. Just after collision, I know that I'm going to have a new angular velocity that's going to be rotating around this leg. So it's gonna to have to be orthogonal to that. That's the only place it can rotate in the new coordinate when this foot's got a pin joint, okay. This is V plus. And in fact, geometrically, it is exactly the projection of this vector up onto V plus. All energy that's around, in, you know, around that point of collision is conserved and all energy going down into it is lost. It works out, all the equations are in the notes, it works out that the update law, when you're rolling forward and you're sort of in the, the easy rolling regime is that theta dot plus is cosine two alpha theta dot minus. Cosine is always less than or equal to one, I'm only gonna lose energy at the moment of collision. It happens for the pendulum um, with constant energy. We can't integrate the equations of motion of the pendulum, I've said that a bunch of times, 
But we can take two positions and ask where they go by just saying the energy is conserved. So I actually can also write the, the, a closed form expression saying if I start if I start at any point on this line, I can ask which state I, I end up when I hit this line. That's something I can do by just saying there's some when theta equals some value and I have some theta dot, I have some total energy, and I've got a different point with a different theta, and so theta dot has a unique solution just by conservation of energy. So I have two, uh, two governing equations here. I say when I start here and I simulate forward, I can compute by simulating the forward dynamics or in closed form where the system's gonna hit, and then I reset it back and, and drop it by cosine two alpha. Okay, and let's just see what that system of equations simulating a little hybrid robot can do. Ah, oh, should I close that? Okay. I know you guys don't care as much about the code, but um, all right. This is just the basic rimless wheel simulation. It does exactly what I showed you before. Uh, from some nominal set of initial conditions, it slows down, comes into a stable limit cycle, and uh, and rolls forever. Okay. Now the cool thing is when you start changing around different initial velocities. Okay, you can imagine it taking different paths around here. So first of all, in this picture, if I start with a, I'm gonna start them all here, okay? If I start with a very large initial velocity, what's gonna happen? I have a huge velocity, I'm gonna impact, but I'm gonna go down pretty fast. Huge velocity, impact, go down pretty fast. Huge velocity, impact, because I, my decrease is proportional to my velocity, okay? But we're gonna see that it's actually even from a large initial velocity, like initial velocity, angular velocity of five. Now, that's not super large. I'll do a 10, that's faster. It slows down very quickly to the same stable limit cycle, okay? Um, if I start more slowly, what can happen, okay? For instance, there's a critical point where I cross under here where I'm not going to go back to this. I'm going to go, then I'm going to lose some energy. It actually comes over here, loses some energy, comes over here, and what's it going to do? It's going to slowly converge to the standing fixed point, but it's going to be, you know, the only reason I simulate that is because it's infinitely frequent collisions. I think that's what happens in this one. Yeah. Uh, that one still rolls. Let's start. Damn you, rimless wheel. It's better when I go uphill. That's, I mean, I, I set these numbers carefully at one point. I should have just listened to myself. Okay, if I go uphill, there we go. So I rolled uphill, okay, and then, so a little easier that way. Because So the reason, let's just make sure I justify what just happened here. So if I start here, it's actually possible that if I come here, because of the asymmetry, I can go here, and I can bounce out, actually. I can end up, you see how this curve is higher than this curve? I can actually go here and bounce out here and then get out and still roll. So you have to be, I, I do have to be careful starting it there. Okay, but starting it up the hill, this is an initial condition where it runs out of energy and stands still. The more I slope, or the, you know, the less I slope the ramp, I can change, I can shift that asymmetry by moving that whole thing. The cool thing is you can also go, you can start like way down here and you can end up either standing or rolling, right? Depending on when, as you're coming through this, whether you get captured by this basin of attraction or by this basin of attraction. 
So the minus 5 velocity stopped. The minus 4.8, almost the same, it goes up and then it comes back down and it starts rolling forward forever. Okay, now let me just show it here. This is the, the phase portrait exactly like we just drew. All right, that's the pendulum's eyeballs over there, okay? And that's coming to the, that's the initial condition. It slows down and we can change all those things. So like the, the interesting one was negative five. It ended up rolling. And negative 4.8, wait a second, negative 4.8 ends up stopping, okay? So s slightly different velocities going uphill leads to either stable or um, unstable fixed points, rolling fixed points. Is that cool? It turns out you can draw the Poincaré map because we can because we can integrate everything in closed form, we can solve the inelastic collision in closed form. The same way I was able to, to sketch it for the Van der Poel oscillator, I can exactly draw this curve for the rimless wheel. And this is what it looks like, okay? This is initial angular velocity. There's a fixed point here, a rolling fixed point, and there's a standing fixed point. Those are the only times the, the line crosses the line of slope one, okay? It turns out that the shaded region, region is in the basin of attraction of the rolling fixed point, and the white region is the region of attraction of the standing fixed point. Okay, these are the, you know, the critical velocities of whether you, when you just barely go up and come back, or you just barely go up and go over. And the funny thing is, um, the basin of attraction of the rolling, forward rolling fixed point has these stripes going backwards in time, right? Because there's some velocities that I'll, um, you know, that I'll come back and stop and some other velocities where I come back with enough energy to roll forward. And because the system is a contraction, it dissipates energy in this proportional way, that size of that region grows as it moves ba based on the number of steps. So you, that region of attraction grows proportion to that cosine two alpha. Yes? So we don't understand what W2 is, but I would expect the entire region to be W1, W2 to be white. So, like so it's exactly what I was saying, is that when this is shifted, you can be inside the a critical velocity, but you can escape out it's exactly that picture I drew badly here. You're inside the um, homoclinic orbit. Th those are the homoclinic orbits in positive and negative velocities. That's what omegas are. And uh, you're inside the homoclinic orbit of the pendulum, but you can still escape and roll forward. Yes? So it's a, the, the graphical analysis way to analyze the system is to iterate that blue curve. Um, but you can, we can use Lyapunov arguments to actually conclude that those regions are all in the attraction, region of attraction. Yep. I, I, I want you to understand this one. This is the last walking system we'll ever completely understand. <laughs> uh, but it's beautiful. Like we can understand everything about it, right? And you can build, uh, we've built rimless wheels, and, you know, they, apart from bouncing and having to have a ridiculously large mass to, uh, and skinny little legs to make the model look, well, you know, to make that point mass assumption good. Um, but, you know, this is real. This, is, this works. Okay, so where do you go from that? Um, so it turns out this is called the compass gate robot, okay?
We've taken away that assumption of all the spokes. We've added a pin joint at the hip. And we've added now, so, we, so you think about what, what happened here. So we add a pin joint at the hip. Now there's two relevant dynamics. There's the relevant of the center of mass falling. There's the dynamics of the center of mass falling. And there's also the dynamics of the swing leg. If I have a massless leg that I've underdefined, there's a, there's a limit where people study actually the, the dynamics of the massless leg. But I've added a second mass here, a point mass somewhere in the middle of the leg, so that I have a reasonable inertial um, dy dynamic model of the swing leg. And just to make everything symmetric, I put it in both sides because the legs are going to take turns. Okay, so those are the point masses. Okay. Um, similarly, I'm going to put it on a small ramp, call it a gamma. Okay, um, and this also, if you give it a little push, walks downhill, falls into a stable limit cycle. Right? There's uh, same same exact dynamics. You lose some energy on collision with the ground, you gain some energy from going down the ground, and you can fall into a stable limit cycle. This one doesn't have the beautiful big basin of attraction where you can only roll or stand still. This one falls down all the time, right? So this is, a, this is now a much more fragile system where you can, I mean, you really can fall down, and uh, the basin of attraction of the walking fixed point is actually pretty small. It's also in higher dimensions, so I can't cartoon it on the board or, or plot it beautifully, but you can plot slices of it. I think I've got that on the next slide here. Awesome. Didn't mean to click on that. So first of all, this is the stable limit cycle. Okay, I've plotted it again, theta of the, of the leg versus theta dot of the leg. It lives in four dimensions, so I had to do a trick to plot it. This is the standard trick in the, the field, okay? But this, I hope you'll see, is like the rimless wheel. It happens to be the, the one down here, okay? It's like whoosh. Or it's actually coming this way, it's whoosh, right? That's the rimless wheel. This is the stance leg falling, okay? Then there's a discontinuous loss of velocity when the foot hits the ground. And then in that same leg becomes the swing leg, and it swings back through with positive velocity, okay, until it hits the ground, instantaneous loss of velocity, and off it goes again. And that's a stable limit cycle. It has some basin of attraction that you can imagine there's a region in the vicinity of that which we can understand. You can also do Poincaré analysis we tend to draw surfaces of section either here or here, are both natural choices. And you can study the eigenvalues of the, of the stability, for instance, the local stability. All of these things are the fundamental concepts, I think, of walking robots. The slice that I promised is here, okay? It's this weird, um, you know, disconnected in this particular slice, but probably connected in different parts of the state space, uh, you know, but narrow band of stability for the system. In fact, you know, we, we have sums of squares certificates that show that this thing is stable and estimate an inner version of the basin of attraction and they, you know, find sort of the biggest ellipse typically or quadratic form, you know, or quartic form for instance that sort of fits inside here. They don't do a very good job of sneaking up into that part. In low degree polynomials don't do a very good job, but we can certify Usefully large basins of attraction inside there. And once you add a motor, then the basins of attraction can get a lot bigger. This is, um, this is asking a lot for a system that has no brain, right? Uh, so, so things get much bigger once you have a controller. It's interesting how people add control to the system. You can imagine a natural thing would be to add an actuator at the hip. That's very much like an acrobat, right? The other natural place, I mean, some people put a actuator at the foot. I always think that's cheating. You kind of, you, that's only sort of a reasonable thing if you have a super large foot. Um, so I don't like that one as much. But another uh, super useful place to add actuation is actually to add an impulsive push-off at the foot. So right as you're about to 
to leave the ground, you're allowed to impart an impulsive push off uh, in the direction of the leg. And that can be a very good way to, uh, it's, a, it's a simple model and it captures some interesting energetics of, uh, of walking. And the reason it does goes back to that picture I drew just a minute ago, okay? So the reason that's an interesting choice is if you think about the, I did it in my blue again here, my velocity just before impact, my velocity just after impact, and this being my loss, okay? It turns out if you apply an impulse here that pushes the robot this way, you can cause an instantaneous change of velocity that's, that is in the, along the axis of the leg, okay? And by doing so, you can actually not only have a, a, a larger velocity out, but that of course bonds to having lost considerably less energy on impact. Andy Ruina has um, a beautiful paper saying that basically you can be four times more efficient if you just push off right before you land, okay? And so, um, you know, it's, it's basically this energetic argument is that this is a, an extremely effective time in your gait right before you land to push off. It's super interesting though how people actually do it. Um, there's been prosthetics, for instance, that try to um, store energy on impact, like your heel strikes. You, st you start storing energy into a spring, you, you lack, lock it with some sort of a, you know, some sort of a catch, and then try to release right at the moment. Those have, you know, there's been a lot of effort put in there. I'm not sure if anyone actually um, crossed the the, there's a barrier uh, that people talk about in, in active orthotics like that where you lose some efficiency, the human loses some efficiency in terms of measuring their volume of oxygen consumed just by putting on a big chunk of aluminum on their foot, right? And then you gain some efficiency by putting power into the system. And at some point you'd like to gain more energy than you've, or, you know, efficiency than you've lost. Um, I don't remember if anybody has actually crossed that barrier with that particular design. There's designs that have done that more recently. Uh, but it, se it just seems like a really good idea, right? It's to store energy and, and, and push off. And then there's all kinds of philosophies of running, for instance, about you know, uh, trying to minimize your, your, uh, your collisions with the ground to save energy, right? And potentially even to do ground speed matching. So if, you pull, if you're actively pulling your feet back so that your foot is going at the same velocity as the ground as you're moving forward, that can be a a beautiful uh, way to, to save energy too. Okay, but most of these you can actually see in the equations of the very simple walking robots. Any big questions about that? You can go even farther. This is the need compass gate, okay. It's actually, um, so, so now we have obviously a knee. We also have a knee cap, right? Where there's an impulsive collision when the knee goes up and hits there. Otherwise it would just keep swinging past, right? There's a little itty bitty mass. We tried to build this one too. That was, we had a lot of shattered legs uh, in that set of experiments, okay? But in principle it can work. It has an even smaller basin of attraction, uh, but it has these beautiful limit cycles, right? Where you have almost the, rimless wheel cycle and the, you know, the same kind of thing as the compass gate, but you have these extra events. Both when you're the swing leg, you have a large change in velocity because your knee hit, okay? But you can actually, that also affects the stance leg too. You can see the instantaneous change of velocity over in the stance leg. Okay, um, I, told, I told these guys I have one more video that I'll show but I, and I got permission to show it, but I probably didn't get permission to like broadcast it on YouTube. So maybe Lou, if you wanna um, say bye to the YouTube folks and I'll show you guys one more. I'll give you a little you know, fun video since you came to class today on a nice sunny day.